Alright, let's just get some stuff out of the way. They recast Grindelwald, he's Mads Mikkelsen now. Johnny Depp got the crap beat out of him by his wife, and now he's to blame or something. Ezra Miller got arrested in Hawaii for choking some lady, and... They're probably gonna get killed off now because their film career is basically done. Then there's J.K. Rowling, who's always in the background, making movies that are written like books and claiming that Hermione was actually black and an amputee the whole time. Plus, the last movie was pretty much universally disliked, so there was definitely no pressure on this movie. Nope, not at all. But they actually did. For some sick reason, I actually like The Secrets of Dumbledore. And that was the last thing I expected. But why is it good? Well, for one, part one, world building. Why do random machines in the background always turn on at the exact wrong time? Okay, anyway, this movie has a substantial amount of iceberg under the water. And for those of you who don't know what I mean, there's a metaphor in world building that's this iceberg, which you've probably seen somewhere. Above the water is the stuff that's happening, basically on screen, the stuff you can clearly see is happening. But below the screen is where the important stuff happens. You don't see these things on screen, but you at least know that they're happening somewhere. So I'm just gonna do the Star Wars example. It's really easy. Small rebel force fighting a giant empire. We obviously don't see every single thing that the Rebel Alliance does on screen, but at least we're shown in a believable way that those things actually exist. Compare that to The Crimes of Grindelwald. Every meaningful thing, or not even that, just any thing that's currently happening is being shown on screen. We're told that Grindelwald has big plans for a future where wizards are able to come out of hiding and take over the world. And we see him telling people about this in a giant underground room. And we watch Newt and his friends on every step of their journey toward accidentally discovering this meeting. But we don't get any feeling that things are happening not on screen. There's the good guys, there's the bad guys, they're together, they fight, and that's it. Nothing or no one behind the scenes. And that's why that movie felt so small. This movie kind of realized what was wrong and ever so slightly fixed it. At least we know that Grindelwald is running for Chancellor of the Universe. But we get the feeling that this election is something that people talk about. The world actually feels lived in, and it actually feels like there are consequences, and like emotions, and like things. That's important. Things are important. There are a few issues I have with the world though, like the magic. The vibe of the magic in this movie was actually pretty good, but some of it wasn't really explained. And I know that magic doesn't have to make sense, but there still needs to be an explanation, you know? Like the final battle in the other dimension, or Dumbledore pushing Credence through the ground with a device that turns off lights. Yeah, I'm gonna need a bit of an explanation for that one. And of course, they fell into the trap of nostalgia bait. Certainly not as bad as the last one, but still very, very clear. Like that port key could have gone to literally anywhere, and Dumbledore could have talked to Newt and Theseus and all of them literally anywhere. So why Hogwarts? Because then we wouldn't get to see Jacob talking to Hogwarts students like a weird fan fiction. But that's not too big of a problem. It only lasts for a little while. So before we address the plot, I think it's worth mentioning that the characters in this movie were pretty not terrible. Well, some of them weren't terrible. So Grindelwald, we'll just get it out of the way. I do like Mads Mikkelsen. He's definitely a good actor, but I heard someone say this and I really wish I could remember who it was so I could cite them. But He's kind of like Ryan Reynolds in that he can really only play himself. And Grindelwald is a character that should probably have his own, you know, character. And Johnny Depp did that really well. He made Grindelwald a really intimidating villain, and he looked cool. What is this half-hearted heterochromia they did on Mads? You can barely even tell. And then there's Dumbledore. For being titled The Secrets of Dumbledore, I was actually surprised at the number of secrets. And Dumbledore. I kind of thought they just named the movie that because they didn't know what else to name it. Like they did with The Rise of Skywalker. And The Last Jedi. And The Force Awake. I also like how they weren't afraid to admit that he and Grindelwald were in love. Even though it was shallow enough that China could remove all mentions of it without a second thought. So yeah, she was probably just promoting the message as she always does. It still felt like the dynamic had some sort of something behind it. Hey, at least they didn't go into detail about their intense sexual relationship. Also, I like Credence now. It might just be, be because his ugly haircut is gone. That, it was so bad. And even though he probably should have died in the first movie, he actually has a purpose now. 
him reuniting with his dad was really cool, and now he's okay with dying peacefully, which he will probably do. Off screen. And Newt, we can't forget about him, even though Rowling kinda did. Well, technically, Newt was in this one a fair amount. He's still one of the best characters, and it might just be because of Eddie Redmayne. For the one scene he gets with Tina, which is also the only scene with Tina, it's actually not cringy, which lots of romances are. Like the Jacob and Queenie romance. I just like Queenie. Her arc here is just so badly written, and it all comes down to the Zuko principle. The Zuko principle is something I made up just now, named after Zuko. Basically what it says is this. Redemption arcs work best if something is sacrificed, and it doesn't necessarily have to be death, like unless I'm having amnesia, Zuko was fine, but they at least have to give up something to prove that they're actually like willing to change, just like when Zuko sacrifices himself for Katara, unless, again, I'm having amnesia, I haven't seen that show in a while. But with Queenie, she realizes the error of her ways, she switches back to the good side, and she loses nothing. In fact, she actually gains something. She marries Jacob, even after he put that disturbing as hell love spell on him in the last movie. Nobody cares that she used to be a crucial part of a terrorist organization, because she's back now. And that's not how you write a story. How much more satisfying would it have been if Queenie had suddenly realized that she was going about her life the wrong way and decided to sacrifice herself to save the others in some way? Maybe she could look at Jacob and say, I love you, I'm sorry, or not, it doesn't really matter. Queenie's character is just such a good example of how not to write a character arc. You don't get rewarded for solving a problem that you created, so why did she get to marry Jacob? And speaking of Jacob, his inclusion is one of the strangest parts of the movie. Kinda like Credence, I used to think he should have left the series after the first movie. His departure was just so perfect, and he really didn't need to show up again. But apparently it was too difficult for Rowling to leave him the hell alone because she had to come up with some gibberish about how the spell only erases bad memories and he only had good ones. Like, what? But now he's literally the best part of the movie and I can't imagine it without him. They found a reason to justify him being there, kind of, and the super rare wand thing didn't bother me as much as it should have. Then some other people. Yusuf Kama contributed nothing and did not need to be in the story. Lally was really fun, even though she entered the story from basically nowhere, and Aberforth was actually really good. Finally getting the reveal about Ariana and seeing how that, plus Credence being his illegitimate son, that was actually something I did not expect to get from the grumpy bartender at the Hog's Head. But it worked, so that's cool. And Bunty is now a main character for some reason, and I don't know why, but it kind of made sense in the end, so hooray. And I guess I've delayed it long enough, it's time to talk about the plot, baby! Let's just do this really quickly so I don't have to think about it. 1. I like Ariana being an obscure, even though it was basically canon for years anyway. That's not what this section is for, this is for complaints. The rest will be complaints, I promise. 2. They used to use chillins to vote in the election, but they don't anymore. And the guy they literally just acquitted for terrorism, who's also running in that same election, just happens to have one. And the other candidates just go along with that, like, no, it's not a reanimated corpse, why would you think that? It clearly chose me to be wizard chancellor, it just makes no sense. 3. They basically kind of completely ignore Friends of Grindelwald. So like Lita, both of the Scamander brothers literally loved Lita and she died. And they never even say her name. Yusuf says her name and he didn't even need to be there. Could have been like a way for the brothers to bond or something, but I guess she just doesn't exist now. And then Nagini. I know the actress was pregnant during filming, but they could have at least mentioned her. Really gonna pretend like all that didn't happen? 4. This is a movie where a bunch of wizards try to stop another wizard from becoming the wizard president. I don't care how fun it is, there are literally infinite other things to do. 5. When the second chillin chooses Dumbledore and he says no, that's fine. It fits with his character. Then they give the presidency to this Brazilian woman. Why? She's not important. Literally do anybody else. Do Newt so he actually has a reason to be here. Heck, do Jacob. It doesn't matter. This is literally the point of the whole movie. And six, the final battle. Yes, I'm mentioning it again. It makes no sense. This other dimension stop time thing is absolutely ridiculous, and it's never explained. Did the blood pack do this? I was not aware that mixing two people's blood together did such things, so it must be something else, but what is that something? We may never know. Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them. Tried to be a good movie. It didn't completely rely on being related to Harry Potter, stood on its own. And then it did well at the box office, and J.K. Rowling completely threw all of her efforts straight off the top of a skyscraper and wrote The Crimes of Grindelwald. Except then, that movie was regarded as one of the worst Harry Potter movies, so she figured she'd put some effort in again. And now, we're at The Secrets of Dumbledore. A handful of bad things, but pretty much erased by all of the good things, resulting in a somewhat positive-ish net worth. 
Even if the crimes of Grindelwald basically did a very small something, the something made me feel incredibly empty. I didn't actually feel anything. And this movie basically ended where it started, minus the broken blood pact and Credence probably dead in some alleyway. But I actually felt some small emotion, which I would say is better. This movie gets an 8 out of 10. Fantastic Beast 4, the evil plot of Queen Stiffer Goldstein, can't wait to see it. Well, if you'll excuse me, I'll be running away from this angry man chasing me. Goodbye!